bless you all this morning. It's good to see you here today in the house of the Lord. And it's good to be um, celebrating these times that we're living in together. And um, Christmas has, um, hope was good for you. It's, it's a time of so many uh, mixed emotions. Somebody told me years ago, Pastor, do you know what mixed emotions are? And I said, no. And he said, it's when your mother-in-law drives off a cliff in your new car. But uh, no, that's terrible. That's terrible, isn't it? Isn't that awful? That's awful. With the mother in love I had. And uh, a lot of mixed emotions in my heart this week. But um, a new grandbaby to, to, um, to brighten our uh, holidays in such marvelous ways I can't even begin to describe. Uh, but some of you grandparents understand, and I'm catching up. And um, I'm thankful for all of you. And, and um, you know, I thought a lot about today and, Lord, what am I going to preach and what am I going to share? And I, uh, there was a little part of me that wanted to go lightweight and, you know, just relish the moment, have a little sweet service and send you all home. And, and then I thought about it. No, you know, the world system has not taken a break from what they're shouting at us. And uh, we better not take a break from the truth because we need the truth. We need to know how to share and I got to tell you guys, I don't mean to speak for my generation um, and stereotype us, but for me, I don't always feel like our generation has done the best job in equipping this new generation that God's bringing on the scene to understand things in biblical terminology and understand things in the heart of God to what we're facing so that they can speak to it and they can understand the life that God has called for all of us to live. Um, my generation, sometimes we like to moan and groan and complain, but we don't always know how to speak the truth. Boy, I feel alone right now. But anyway, <laughs> I, I believe the Lord's doing some changing in all of us. Do you feel that way that God's changing us and put an ur urgency in our spirit and um, teaching us how to, um, to do this God's way? And so I'm going to talk about the kingdom. We're just going to dive right back into our series. I had our Christmas message last week. Today we're just going to dive back into the kingdom. I'm going to talk about national justice. And um, it, it is a kind of a heavy message in a way, but I believe it's timely. I believe it's what we need to understand and know. And uh, I'm going to dive in as hard as I can and try to finish this message on time. The term social justice is difficult because it means different things now to different people. Many times it's used now as a catchphrase for illegitimate forms of government that promote the redistribution of wealth, the expansion, control, and even overuse of civil government. This intrudes on the authority of God's other decentralized forms of government which, as we've learned in the past, in case you weren't here, are self, family, and church. In other words, God is God all by himself. He is centralized, but he decentralized us because of sin, and he decentralized government. We, when we hear the word government, we think of national or state governments, but in the Bible, when you think of government, you should always, and, and I'm not going to go back into this. We've spent a lot of time on it in the past. We should think that God decentralized government into self-government. Self is learning how to live for the Lord and have a personal relationship with him and have personal responsibility and be able to be, have some self-control because you have a family that has taught you that. You have a father who has ministered to your heart and a mother who has lived for the Lord in front of you. And you have a church family who has supported the family effort and the word of God. And you have a government, the national and a federal federal government, a civil government, if you will, that, um, that, that understands their role in helping families and the church to live in a godly society under the morals of God according to the Word of God. Now, that's the way it should work. Much of today's application of social justice is a contradiction and a denial of biblical justice. Biblical justice seeks to protect individual liberty while promoting personal responsibility. 
This liberty moves beyond being freed from bondage, but delivered from moral corruption to a possession of holiness. I can no longer use the term social justice. I'm just going to say that. I, I, I can't use the term social justice anymore. Because of the abuse of its definition, I will use the term biblical justice instead. Biblical justice puts the, God's principles and values front and center. Moses said in Deuteronomy 32, 4, did you notice I'm diving in hard? So you got to catch up. Some of you are on a sugar high rush or whatever, and you're about to bottom out, but pick it up. This is the day the Lord hath made. You all with me? Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His deeds are perfect, Moses said. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. God's plan should be applied without partiality. Moses also said in verse 16 of Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 17, he said, I instructed the judges, you must hear the cases of your fellow Israelites and the foreigners living among you. Be perfectly fair in your decisions and impartial in your judgments. Hear the cases of those who are poor as well as those who are rich. Don't be afraid of anyone's anger, for the decision you make is God's decision. Bring me any cases that are too difficult for you, and I will handle them. And he also said, Moses in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15, one verse that I want to share there, do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always, he says, always judge people fairly. All right, it's the civil government's job to be God's instrument of divine justice by impartially establishing, reflecting, and applying God's divine standards of justice in society. When Moses urges Israel to obey the Lord, he told them in Deuteronomy 4, 7, and 8, for what great nation, I'm using some scriptures here because I really want to lay a foundation for some things that I feel like I need to say that grips my heart to say them. But it's not about my opinion, it's about the word of the Lord. For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I am giving you today. So let me give you the definition in your outline of biblical justice. It is the unbiased and impartial application of the rule of God's moral law in society. So why are we experiencing something so vastly different now in America, in our American culture? And I, I want to say it, like this. I've, I've, pick, I've tried to pick my words wisely right here. It's because of the division between sacred and secular that has led to national disintegration. God never intended, and, and I know this is going to be new for some of you, God never intended for this separation. All through the Bible, God's plan has been the integration of the spiritual and the social as we live out our lives. They were never to be separate. Whenever this is not happening, we have disintegrating immorality and chaos. We read in 2 Chronicles 15, 2 through 4, listen to me, Asa. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them and without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. Now this verse gives me hope. Hope that there are some American people here that are going to turn to God. And I hope it starts with us, if we need to, to turn to God. Because if we will, if we'll call out on the name of the Lord and we'll go after God's plan, God's principles, God's moral law, his son Jesus Christ, we'll go after all that he's made possible, the word of God says, if we'll do it, 
we'll find him. It was man's refusal to submit to divine authority that led to the first social disintegration. When we disobey God, it always leads to family breakdown. It always leads to economic struggle. It always leads to emotional instability and destruction. God established Israel's constitution when he gave them the Ten Commandments. They were divided, if you'll notice, and I don't have time to go into them today, but if you go back and look at the Ten Commandments, they were divided between man's vertical responsibilities to God and his horizontal responsibilities to his neighbor. Why? Because God knew that both were important for the proper functioning of society. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. God also wanted his people to reflect his character through charitable works and acts of kindness to all people. Biblical justice promotes freedom by putting an emphasis, listen to me, it puts an emphasis on accountability, impartiality, and responsibility as spiritual foundations are being laid in the social realm. God has given our civil government the task of impartially protecting the unalienable rights that we call life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This concept by, Americans, by America's founders were framed by the scriptures in the Bible. And, and I won't take time today, but if you want to know what those scriptures are that literally framed the Constitution of the United States of America, of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, they're all framed according to scripture. You email me, call me, and I will send you all those scriptures. I have a whole list ready to let you uh, enjoy and look up. We read in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. God determines what is right, what is wrong. Hey, listen, his standards do not change. And he is no respecter of persons. Romans 2.11, for God does not show favoritism. Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. So I'm going to give you some things about what biblical justice means this morning. Number one, God is the deliverer and help in time of need. Throughout scripture, God revealed himself as a defender and a deliverer. I want to read to you Zechariah 7, starting at verse 9. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Judge fairly, show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress, now, look at this. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. And do not scheme against each other. Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. They made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the messages that the Lord of heaven's armies had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. This is why the Lord of heaven's armies was so angry with them. So what is the role of church believers concerning national justice? What is our role? It's to execute divine justice primarily to these four groups of people, widows, Orphans, foreigners, and the poor. We need to pay close attention to how justice is being admonished to these four groups especially. James tells us in James 2, 15 through 18, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, because somebody always argues. <laughs> Some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? 
I will show you my faith by my good deeds. See, we as the Lord's church are not to have class or racial prejudice. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. The church is commissioned to meet the physical needs of those who lack within our church family. But this should not be confused with subsidizing irresponsibility. There's biblical justice right there. We bring help to people that need help. But not subsidizing irresponsibility. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, even while we were with you, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Proverbs 10.4, lazy people are soon poor, hard workers get rich. Proverbs 13.18, if you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. Mm, Boy, we need to hear that one. We live in a world today where if you get any correction by someone who loves you enough to challenge your perspective, in a lot of people's minds today, that means they're against me and they cut off the relationship when maybe they're the best friend you have. I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you. You're a lot like me. I need a different perspective a lot of times in my life, don't we? We need a different perspective. We need a brother or sister to come alongside of us and say, yes, but have you thought about this? Do you remember the scripture that says this? Can you pull back for a minute? You're in the moment so hard, you're neck deep in this. Can you pull back and see a bigger picture? And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, brother. It's one of the things I'm asking the Lord for for my life right now is I feel like there are some, a couple of wonderful things on the horizon for us as a church. And in this next season, though it might be hard work, and it might even be difficult, and there might be some challenges, I felt like the Lord has said to me, it's all of that, but can you do something you're not very good at, Timbo? The Lord seems to call me Timbo. And I said, what's that, Lord? He said, could you learn to enjoy the journey a little more? Could you calm down? I'm like, I don't know. But I know that the Lord has a plan. It's time to enjoy the journey in God. Doesn't mean it's easy. But how many know when we're obeying the Lord, there's joy in the journey? The Bible is clear on spiritual ministry and social responsibility working hand in hand. Now see, I'm trying to draw something before you leave here today to make an impression that I believe the Lord by his spirit wants to say to us about this. I'm thankful that we as a church are willing and anxious to help people. But we have learned that to help people, there also must be responsibility. If they're unwilling to work a plan, then our responsibility to help them turns into enablement. And much of the enablement we see in our nation today, I'm going to say it from the pulpit, loud and clear, and on Facebook and YouTube Live, next service, Lord willing, much of the enablement we see in our nation today is destructive. It's destructive. Whenever God's principles of social justice are not being withheld, things do not get better for a people or for a nation. They get worse. All right, I'm tempted to veer off my notes. Help me, Lord. All this money that's been printed... We're all paying for it every day right now. Biblical justice means, secondly, we cannot separate our love for God and for others. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, 
you were doing it to me. Micah tells us what the Lord requires of us in Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't help people. But, oh, dear Lord, the government has no relationship at that level with people. So what do they do? They just print money for everybody. I'm not saying people don't need help in times of crises like we've been through. I'm not saying that. Don't hear me wrong. But I'm saying if this thing was set up God's way, well, Pastor, it's not. I know. We're, we're going to have to get back to the truth. We're going to have to get back to understanding the responsibility starts at home with families working together, with dads leading the household, with a mom that is a help, true helpmate working together, raising up God-fearing children, and then churches that can come alongside families and help them. And when, they're, when, when a widow or a widower doesn't have a family, the church becomes their family. They don't go without unless that church is going without. As long as that church has something, that widow has something. And then the civil government provides an atmosphere where these things can happen and we start caring for one another through relationship and holding one another accountable then we don't have millions of people not working. The second most talked about subject in Scripture after money is the poor. More than 300 verses directly relate to the treatment of the poor, strategies to aid the poor, God's intentions for the poor, and what our perspective should be towards the poor. God cares about the poor because many times they're the most vulnerable to injustice. Doing justice fulfills two, the two greatest commandments given to us by Jesus. Let me read them to you. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Isn't that something? The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love for God does not express itself in love for our, if love for God that does not express itself in love for our neighbors is not real love. That's what the Bible just said. It's not real love. Jesus linked our attitude toward God with our attitude toward others. Whew, that's a challenge, isn't it? My attitude towards you is directly related to my attitude towards him. So some of you better straighten up because I need a better attitude towards you. <laughs> no, I better straighten up. Because you need me to have a better attitude towards you when you're off in your perspective and you're thinking and you need some brotherly love. Good words are not good works. Nor are they simply good things. And you don't even have to be Christian to do good things. The unsaved can build orphanages and houses, give money, visit the sick, do good things. But what the unsaved cannot do is glorify God through good works. Good works for God's people should always be tied to God's glory. John told us in 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Wow, that's in the Bible. 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. James defines true religion by how we treat the widow and the orphan. Here's an, here's an amazing verse. Old brother James, man, he cuts right to the chase. He says in James 1, 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. 
The first century church became known for its good works. We find in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. Members of the church were taught this in, in Galatia. The church at Galatia. We read it in Galatians 6 starting at verse 7 that says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Biblical justice is foundational to fulfilling the purpose of the church's kingdom agenda. Thirdly, biblical justice means the gospel includes justice. Now, I couldn't leave this part out. I, I think it's a given, but, but I better not let... So let me take a moment with it. Because I think we need this perspective. It's sad that the term gospel has been... I don't know how to say this any better. It's been reduced. The term gospel has been reduced in many people's minds to referring to only the plan of salvation. This limited understanding can cause people to be concerned about people's souls for eternity and ignore their well-being in time, in their life now. That's sad. That, that's, the, that's the movement that your pastor and my dad came out of where we, we talk about their soul, we talk about eternity, we talk about a ticket to heaven, but we don't necessarily teach each other how to live for God today. Paul wrote about the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read it to you, verse 1. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news. That's the gospel. I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. As the Scripture said, he was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. Now, that's the gospel, but the span of the gospel reaches farther into sanctification. In other words, God's people being set apart for him, for his kingdom agenda in the earth. It's the process of, of making us holy. It contains the concepts of justice and social action. In other words, salvation leads to us knowing how to live, how to function, how to speak, how to be set apart for God's purpose, how to speak the word of the Lord, how to be holy in, in our living. We see this in Paul's word to the Christians in Galatia. Galatians 2.14, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter, in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? Here, the word gospel is being used in concert with someone's eternal destiny. The gospel, here, here's what I want to say about this. The gospel encompasses the whole person, as stated by Paul. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. I, I, I lived in a world for a long time where people, people felt like they could live like hell and still go to heaven. People could gossip and backbite and torture others. But I'm saved on my way to heaven. And I think, looking back, we missed the heart of the gospel. One day when Jesus was on the earth, he returned to Nazareth and went to the synagogue, and he was handed scrolls, the scrolls of Isaiah, 
And here's what was read, and I'll read it to you from Luke 4. Jesus said in the synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and then he began to speak to them. And the scripture you've just heard, he said, has been fulfilled this very day. The timing of Jesus reading this in the synagogue was crucial. He chose this passage when the Jews were in the middle of economic, political, and social crises. Jesus came into the world in the midst of society experiencing the devastating effects of injustice. And he says the Spirit of the Lord was on him to bring the good news. Isn't that amazing? The Spirit of the Lord, Jesus said, is upon me to bring good news. To who? The hurting, the suffering, the blind. Those who were in economic crisis, he, the poor, he had good news for them. For those in political crisis, the captives, he had good news for them. For those in social crisis, the oppressed, he has good news for them. The good news that Jesus offered was the gospel of the favor, favorable year of the Lord. That, that leads me to the next point. Biblical justice means the year of Jubilee. That's what that means. The fable, favorable year of the Lord is speaking of the year of Jubilee. To understand it, uh, I'll read Leviticus 25, 9 and 10. On the day of atonement in the 50th year, blow the ram's horn loud and long throughout the land. Set this year apart as holy, a time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. It will be a jubilee year for you when each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors and return to your own clan. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but, but just something to say as it ties into biblical and national justice. On this year, everyone who was in servitude or slavery were set free. Property reverted back to its original owners. This was inaugurated with the day of atonement, which was the day set aside to atone for the sins of the nation and the sins of individuals. The day of atonement was when Israel got right with God through the shedding of blood, the slaying of a sacrifice. Now, here's the point. In other words, they did not get jubilee, God's involvement economically, socially, and political, which was all part of the gospel, without first getting their spiritual condition right. We live in a land today, in America, where people want to get everything fixed in our country. People in the church want to get everything fixed. They want to get things turned around. They want to get this. And and the year of Jubilee says, you can't have that without first getting your spiritual condition right. What should we as the church do? How, how do we live in this world? How is there any hope for America in, in the things that's going on in our country? When each one of us personally and as a church body say, you know what, before we can fix anything, we got to make sure we're right with God. I say that because many people want God to do things for them without being right with him. Many people today are crying for justice or for God to pay this, fix that, redeem this, vindicate them, while they skip over the very thing that begins God's jubilee, God's restorative power. Sin must always be dealt with first. We we have to take this personal, and we have to start here with us. Men, we live for God. Pornography has to go. The sins of the flesh have to go. We're committed and dedicated to live for God. If nobody notices or if everybody notices, our lives belong to him. Our freedom is to serve him, not serve ourselves.
If we as individuals, families, and the church do not repent and live for God, there's not going to be a year of jubilee. By the way, just in case you didn't know this, the Jews never did receive that year of jubilee because they rejected Jesus and his atonement and never got it. It was there for them. The Jews back then were like Americans today. They want the benefits of the Messiah, but sometimes they don't want a relationship with the Messiah. So biblical justice means Christ fifth, Christ is king. The Jews wanted a welfare king and not a king who delivers and makes truly free. The ministry of Jesus gave proper order to how we should approach all issues of justice and social action because they're, they're connected. That's what I'm hoping you're getting here today. These things are connected. For Jesus to make his proclamation merely social is not good news. If a person has the best food and the nicest clothes to wear and the greatest job and dies without a relationship with Jesus, that person has nothing. Nothing. But for Jesus to make his proclamation only for spiritual provision in heaven, but unable to do anything for us while on earth, is not good news either. And this message today is to come along you and say, listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ includes both. The gospel is designed to build God's kingdom rather than to save the world systems. We are being chastised by the world today by being called bigots and people who don't care when the truth is we should be the most caring people on the planet but hold people responsible while we care for them. And by the way, don't be so concerned about what people call you. What does the Lord think of you? How many know we're no greater than our master? They killed him. Our national leaders, by and large, do not understand this. They don't. Without biblical justice, we're always left with physical, social, political, and economic problems. The true church of the Lord Jesus Christ should have the answer for the world today. It's the complete, comprehensive gospel of Jesus. That's the answer. Biblical justice also means, number six, restitution. If the principles of biblical justice were implemented in our society today, we could have so much more restitution and life change. I want to read from Romans. Remember as we read this that governing authorities are more than civil government because the moment most of us hear government, and I hope that's changing in you, most of the time when you hear the word government, you're automatically thinking about civil government. I hope you're starting to realize in the Bible, it may be talking about way more than civil government. It may be talking about family. It might be talking about church. It might be talking about self. It might be talking about all, the, all four. So keep that in mind. Romans 13, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what's right. They will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. All right, so let's use an example. Think about maybe a man in our church caught stealing $10,000 from his employer and is sent to jail. He comes before the judge and the judge sentences him to one year in prison. And Mark, you could probably do a better job with this illustration than me, and I'm thankful for the good things that our prison systems do. And I'm not saying we don't need them, we do. But the last I knew, and it may be more or less, I don't know, it cost taxpayers $40,000 that year to house this guy 
and feed him and imprison him for a year. While he's in there, he learns how to, sometimes live, learns how to live more a life of crime. And his employer that he ripped off for $10,000 is never repaid for the theft. And everybody loses. He loses, his employer loses, the government loses. It sure seems like everybody loses. Now think about this. Three men from our church meet this man in front of the judge, and one of our men here at Calvary say this to the judge, Your Honor, if you'll give this man back to us, we'll assign a man in our church to be responsible for him. We'll help him get a job, and then have his wages over time garnished to pay back his former employ, employer. And if we can't hold him responsible because he has no self-government, no self-control, we'll give him back to you. You can throw him in jail. But if we could have him under our wings and help him serve God, help him work, have his wages garnished over time and pay back his employer, and we can bring him back to you, and in six months or a year, he's paid back what he stole. The taxpayers save $40,000. This guy's now a better man. And when he goes back before the judge, the, the judge says, yay! So what am I saying? I, I know, I know, this sounds like maybe pie in the sky to some of you. Wow, wouldn't it be great? if everything worked that way. All to say, and, and it should start here with us, and it is starting. We're starting to see some things happen in our church. We're starting to see some things happen in our church that is not waiting for it to go to a federal judge or a state or a county judge. There are things that can happen in the church as we care for one another, help each other, help dads and moms train up children in the ways of the Lord. It's, it's messy. It's messy. The church needs to be more involved in biblical just, justice and its messy business. But the rewards can not only be eternal, but they can be now. Biblical justice means, number seven, reconciliation. Jesus was about the Father's business of not only setting the captives free, but also reconciling them, which means to restore relationships. This is what we're to do as well. Jesus restored our relationship with God the Father. If we're truly saved, we've been reconciled back to God. So we're to make reconciliation possible. Number eight, I got two more and we're done here this morning. Biblical justice means responsibility. I've been threading that needle the whole way if you've caught it. One of the tragic mistakes of the civil government, family government, and church government is giving handouts with no demands and no personal responsibilities, none. We are not to be our brother's keeper. We're to be our brother's brother. The far better plan is to seek to give the poor the power they need to ultimately rise above their situation in a position of personal responsibility. The outcome of not doing that for our nation, our families, and now the church is absolutely tragic, and I think we, we can see it. It is pounding at us. I'm so thankful for men and women here at Calvary who love to help mentor and equip other men and women with life skills, socially and spiritually. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. There are many of you sitting right here that spend a chunk of your time every week, every month, to make sure that you're helping mentor and equip and train some men and women who are reaching out for help. God bless you for that. In scripture, charity was essentially an opportunity to work. Did you know that? Charity in Scripture was mostly an opportunity to work. It was shown in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 24. The process, it was the process of gleaning. Oh, go back and read those. 
where the needy could collect the grain that God's people were told to leave behind. They were told to leave, leave, leave some of the crop on the inrows and on the corners. Leave it. Don't take it all. And gleaning provided the opportunity for the poor to help themselves out of poverty while also upholding their dignity since they were participants in the system and not merely passive recipients of charity. This, now I'm going to close with this, so hang on for a minute here and then we're going to go. This is why a just and righteous free market economy which is a biblical economy, is the best system. Other economic systems that stifle, limit, and illegitimately control the ways and means of production not only hinder economic growth, but limit the expression of biblical charity. These systems produce, I promise you this, these systems produce government-run welfare states that keep people trapped in poverty and oppression. The economic responsibility of civil government is to, what is their responsibility of civil government? To remove fraud and coercion from the marketplace so it's free from tyranny. In other words, our government steps in to remove fraud to keep the marketplace free from tyranny. For what? So people can go to work. So people can earn a living. So people can be entrepreneur. So small businesses can rise up and meet needs. What's the government's job? To help freedom reign and then get out of the way. I'm not political. This is the word of God. Centralized governmental control of trade is the economic system of the Antichrist. If you're here today and maybe you've never heard that, I'm going to say it one more time. Centralized government control of trade is the economic system of the Antichrist. Revelations 13, 17, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing its name. And the last thing I will share this morning is biblical justice means imparting knowledge. We need an impartation of knowledge today in the family, the church, in our nation. Folks, it is no longer the day when you can come here to the house of God and hear this from your pastor we got to know this. You got to, well, you don't have to, but I would encourage you to take some of the things that you heard from the Lord in the Word today. We got to start sharing this. We got to start being the hands and feet of Jesus. A lot of people in this world, the only Jesus they'll ever know is if you will be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. They may never come to the house of God until you take the gospel and the truth to them. And, let, and, but, and trust that the Spirit of God will work in them if you will speak truth and light. This is why we need honest people who hold God's standard of truth and justice and willing to do things God's way and not what's necessarily the most popular in a secular world. So here's my closing statement. When unrighteous people rule, there's no moral law. When there's no moral law, there's no presence of God. And when there's no presence of God, there's chaos in society. What's the answer? Jesus. The gospel. The good news. That Jesus came for the hurting. He came to set captives free in time and in eternity. What's the answer for all of us? Jesus. Live for the Lord.
Well, pastor, what if bad things happen before he comes back? Clue. Bad things are happening. Bad things are happening. But we, hey, folks, should anybody on the earth have more hope than what we have? We have hope. We have Jesus, whom to know is life more abundantly. Would you stand? That'll help me close. Why, why am I sharing this message? You know why I'm mostly sharing this message? For people that are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s out here right now, I'm not sharing it for people my age as much. You need it too. I need it. But I'm sharing it for 20s, 30s. Why? Because the Lord slapped me real good here about a year ago because I was having this moment where I'm like, God, I'm not concerned about me no more. I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be with you forever, but what about my kids and now my grandkids? What about them? And I felt like the Lord just kind of gave me a little gentle slap. And he said, I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to raise up a generation that's going to be ready for my return. I'm going to raise up a generation that knows the truth and lives the truth. I'm going to raise up a generation who will serve me with their whole heart, will not be afraid of the pressures of, of their peers. And I see God doing that in this church with young people here that I love that are making their stand for the Lord. They're not playing games. And I am so excited. I'm glad the Lord gave me a little slap and said, stop that. He just reminded me, in every generation, I always have my sons and daughters. What's the question for you this morning? Will you be one? Will you be a child of God? Ready to usher in all that God is doing in the earth. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for these times that we are living in because it's an opportunity to give you much glory and to shine for Jesus. Give our people this morning courage, love for one another, caring for one another, and holding us, each other, responsible in ways that are right and true. I bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. If I don't see you before next year, I'll see you next year. You're dismissed.